Okay, while Dan Danilo uh, puts this together, uh, let me share with you briefly something um, historians argue and believe and hold that the 1960s decade was a pivotal decade in what between what we call modern and postmodern world. Um, I fully understand the confusion about postmodernity, which means quite a lot to different people. But we are just, I'm going to just stay there without any going deeper into what postmodernity is. When we speak of Christianity and what has been happening since after 1945, after the Second World War, in this so-called present postmodern age, we have to also keep in mind that drastic changes, some historians use the term monumental or tectonic shifts or changes have been taking place since then. We have to keep in mind that the changes are not only in culture at large, but also affecting politics, business, and even what is happening in the church and in Christianity. And so, I, as a church historian, uh, I was approached approximately 10 years ago by a friend of mine. It all happened around the Thanksgiving dinner table. Somebody, uh, the, the host, she simply asked me, uh, since you teach church history, what can you tell us about the emerging church? At that point, I knew very little about the emerging church. Uh, like most of the people, I also paid little attention to that, which is somewhat to my embarrassment, but uh, because we are supposed to keep updated all the time on what is going on. But teaching world history, teaching history, teaching church history, basically all necessary courses for the university, uh, sometimes you postpone and all, all, all you can do is read here and there book reviews and advertisements and what you hear and try to keep up uh, with, uh, with, um, uh, with the times. So I simply, I was able to somehow get around it and explain, say whatever I had to say and then she sent me within one week a book to read what she read about the emerging church and basically it was uh, a book, uh, it was the book titled um, uh, The Faith, no, Faith Undone. Some of you probably heard about it and uh, it is written by Roger Oakland, who is not a Seventh-day Adventist and also he is not an emergent. That means he doesn't belong to this, he doesn't identify with this, the emerging church. And uh, I, of course, now you receive a book as a gift, you better read it, because as soon as you see the person, they'll ask you. So I read the book, and immediately, there are three, several, three things happen. Number one, I'm reading, and I'm recognizing, you say, wow, this guy knows what he's talking about. There are a lot of things here that fit with general history. Second thing is, uh, wait a minute, this guy, there are, there are, there are things that I question immediately. Um, as um, uh, statements that he's making, conclusions and all of that, and I say, okay, wait a minute. There has to be more. Maybe uh, this question needs to be asked. And that is the third component because I, as a Seventh-day Adventist, I ask, I may ask same, same questions like non-Adventists, but there are questions that we Adventists ask the others will never ask simply because of our background. And so it is this that I began to address. I said, okay, I, uh, I got interested into the subject of the emerging church and I said, okay, I have to find out what is this phenomenon. Now, uh, and that is how I started, but I decided instead of reading the books written by 
the third party, that means the critics, I'm going to start reading the works of the emergents themselves, I will attend their meetings, I will go to, uh, to get to know them, and what I mean is kind of going to quote original sources. And I'm going to try to kind of explain it from inside, to be fair. And that is how I started. And what I've discovered is not only in academic terms, not only that I'm sharing with others, what I have discovered is that the whole topic brought me to certain awareness of the issues which are going on in contemporary Christianity. Issues that I did not pay attention to or I did not take it seriously or I did not understand the seriousness of, of, of what is going on. And there are a lot of things that are going on out there in the world that we Seventh-day Adventists are not fully aware of, which is to our embarrassment. Uh, I can bring one, for example. Uh, as I began to research this and I started working on it, and the word slowly began to spread across the campus, to my, to, this may come across as criticism in a way it is, but it is more just informative, just to let you know the state of, so, so, so to speak, the state of where we are as the church. And so I discovered my colleagues and even the theologians from the seminary, and I'm not part of the SDA seminary, I am at a co in the college. And they would ask me as we ask each other, okay, what do you do, what are you reading lately, and so what is your research and so on. And we do share that among ourselves. And as I began to share, well, I'm working now on the emerging church. And you know what the reaction is? Most of the time, it was, what is that? And as I begin to share, people begin to look and say, wow, what is that? I say, okay. So I discovered also, because as I, I um, okay, let me just go through the slides. I'm going to skip some slides. Don't, I hope it doesn't bother you that you don't have time to read all of that, because I want to come to what is the most uh, interesting for you because I understand that you as a class focus on the issues of creation and so on. So what I'm going to do is Leonard Sweet, which is well known, Brian McLaren, who is well known among Seventh-day Adventists, and also both of these guys are full-fledged emergents. All of them will tell you and argue that since the 1950s, 1960s, fundamental changes are taking place in uh, in Christian world. And uh, so much, much has been written about the emerging church. If you are interested in the subject, go Google it, type the emerging church or emergent Christianity. You'll have tons of books written by both the emergents and critics and all of that. So I'm simply going to, uh, to push forward. Now, on June 21, 2001, over a phone conference between approximately dozen and a half individuals of young pastors in their 30s, maybe early 40s. Brian, McLare, Brian McLaren is an exception. He's in his 60s. He's probably today about 69, 70. Brian McLaren, all they were talking and they decided how should we call ourselves as a group because uh, as they are trying to not to organize themselves officially but to begin to organize as they are prop propagating what they believe. And they decided to call themselves the Emerging Church. Now, I also found out from Tony Jones, who is one of those individuals, who says in his book that others have already previously labeled or suggested to this group to call themselves the emerging church. Well, when I came across that, that tells me, oh, the idea of the emerging church existed before. It was not created by the emergence in 2001, which prompted me now to go and look for who is the first one who came up with that term. 
and so what I discover is that uh, b um, back in 1968, 68, there is a publication written by Ronald Wilkins who identifies the Catholic Church and the Christian Church as a whole. That means all Christian denominations as the emerging church. So the emerging church, you must keep that in mind. The emerging church is not another denomination, like Baptist Church, Lutheran Church, all that. The emerging church is just a term, a concept, and it never intends to institutionalize itself. And you will see why, because of the very nature of what they believe. And uh, that publication is those two books there that you see at the top. And the, the next volume is published just in, uh, the next one is updated version. Okay, but that's not as much important for you now. This book reveals, number one, that the idea of the emerging church goes back to the very first interpretation of the purpose, intent and nature of the Second Vatican Council. Second, the primary meaning of both emerging and emergent is, quote, going through an evolutionary process rather than the conventional that is assumed by the public, oh, it means we, it just appeared on the scene. The third, the, uh, the idea of Christianity and the church as a whole going through an evolutionary process, like supposedly nature and life do, is directly attributed to the work of Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a well-known paleontologist and also a Jesuit theologian and a mystic. So that should also be kept in mind. Now, this whole, this in itself takes me to the Second Vatican Council. Now, I also discovered, I don't know if I mentioned earlier, I also discovered because now as I encounter, the question is what happened at the Second Vatican Council? Well, I knew something about it from the literature, as I addressed it before in my general teaching, in my teaching career, but now what I discovered is as I began to ask around, I needed help from an expert on the Second Vatican Council. And I started asking, and guess what? With the death of Dr. Dederen, whom I called at the time, and he simply said, John, I'm sorry, I cannot help you. I'm retired, I'm out of the picture, and my health is not well. You have to go. And the best one, he recommended a person from the seminary, but even that person from the seminary is not expert, what we call expert in the Second Vatican Council. And so I began to wonder, I say, how is it, even today, we Seventh-day Adventists do not have an expert on the Second Vatican Council. How is that, how could that be? Somehow we missed it. And what I'm also learning is that we Seventh-day Adventists have not paid attention what is happening and what was happening during this pivotal, tectonic, monumental sh paradigm shift in culture, in worldview, in history, and uh, that started in the 1950s, 1960s. So um, that led me now to go to the Second Vatican Council. Now, I'm going to skip much of this, and I'm going to just briefly tell you uh, what happened. Um, well, I have to move to Teilhard de Chardin. That is of interest for you. At the Second Vatican Council, John, P the new pope in 1959, elected new pope, John Paul, no, Paul, John 23rd, he decided to convene a new council. Everybody in the Vatican was surprised by it. Why do we need a council? The church is not facing a crisis. But John 23rd had a vision. He previously got involved and he learned about the so-called New Theology School of Thought. These are Catholic theologians, most of them Catholic, some of them Protestant, who were, called themselves progressive. And they were 
way different in their vision and seeing the future of the Catholic Church compared to the traditional, conventional conservatives in the Vatican. Now, Pope Pius XII, prior to John XXIII, Pius XII in 1950, in one of his encyclicals, condemned this group of new uh, of progressive theologians. You, uh, if you ever heard of, for example, Karl Rayner, Yves Kangar, Henry de Lubac, Hans Kung, all of these individuals are part of that progressive uh, school of thought. It is Pius XII who labeled them or new theologians who are teaching some new theology in a pejorative term. But that term stuck and they are now, this group is known in history as New Theology School of Thought. These progressives recognized and their goal was that the church should make a turn. And John 23rd decided to call a council. He assigned the putting together of the documents for the council to Cardinal Ottaviani, who in the Vatican circle was known as arch conservative. Ottaviani was putting, put together 10 commissions, each commission on a different topic, and they put together documents, which will be now discussed by the council, which is about two, two and a half thousand members body from Catholic leaders from all over the world. The council opened in 1962. The documents were in preparation for about two and a half years in advance. But John also ap appointed one or two of these academics, experts, who were attending the meetings of these commissions without having right to vote. So, these so experts, academics, of progressives, they were present and they knew what was happening. But they would not be able to shape the documents. Now, what is very important is the documents, as they would come to the council, and the council lasted from 1962 to 1963, 1965. As the documents would come to the council, the council will discuss each document. The experts were allowed to speak at the council. The council people who come from all the world, they were already reading the literature of these theologians. And the council would send documents back to the commission to rewrite them. And these documents were going back and forth until they were accepted by the council. And so when the council was over, it is the conservatives who lost it. And the progressives kind of won it. The victory was not total because the struggle for the Catholic heart, the soul of Catholic Church continued. What is important of this, and this is kind of a new vision, new understanding of Christianity that comes out of the Catholic Church, of the Second Vatican Council, pardon me. That is what is meant by those two books, that they, those authors. 1968, three years later, they published this book and they began to, exp they basically are explaining what I just gave you to, uh, ex ex told you just in a few minutes. What is important as far as you're concerned? This new quote, emergent theology that is beginning to form and it will take several decades until it comes to our times. <coughs> the fruit of the Second Vatican Council scholars are now recognizing actually began to show around 2000. And that, that's the reason why the public in general begins to recognize or, or see, oh, the emerging church, the emerging church, what are we talking about? It took some time. And to the, so as uh, all these ideas permeated into the <coughs> seminaries all over the countries. 
emerging theology or emergent Christianity is a different kind of Christianity. And it has three major trajectories. One is ecumenism. Now you can see why the emergents do not want to institutionalize. Because they themselves believe in ecumenical unity. And by the way, a footnote here, the Catholic Church, prior to the Second Vatican Council, was not interested in ecumenical unity. The shift took place during the Council. And today, the Catholic Church, Lutherans and Anglicans are the championing champions in this ecumenical unity. Now, ecumenical unit number one. The second one is because the Second Vatican Council called the people to holiness. This is when the Church allowed the Catholics to read other b translations of the Bible, not only the Vulgate. That was accepted as revolutionary change. In a way, it was important change. But the church also actively began to instruct people how to do sp uh, this spiritual journey toward holiness. What now begins to happen is pretty much what was happening in the centuries before even at the Council of Trent. The Catholic Church, in order, besides creating the Jesuit society, who are actually intellectual athletes of the church. They were trained people who will respond to the Protestants in an argumentative way. The Catholic Church also employed the mystics. Mystics have a different approach in order to argue, counter Protestant pious, pious uh, piety and cat, uh, Protestant arguments against the church. So what is happening is now that the same thing is happening in the 1960s. Now keep in mind that between Trent and Vatican II, there is about 400 years. And an interesting thing is, right here on this point, I would like to point out to you, an interesting thing is that uh, when I attended one of the meetings down in Dallas, Texas, and Richard Rohr, if you ever heard of him, last name Rohr, R-O-H-R, he's a Franciscan priest, he leads the Center for Action and Contemplation down in Albuquerque, New, New, New Mexico. He is the most popular speaker, always uh, giving presentations to many of these emergent movements, uh, conferences, conventions, and workshops. I attended two of his, these conferences, workshops, and one in the Dallas. He made, a, he was telling us, the audience, now keep in mind that all, everybody in the audience, these are some type of leaders, whether teachers, uh, Sunday school teachers, uh, even teachers in school, uh, public schools. And so these are people who came there for conference, four days lasting, and also workshop. I was there because I was interested to learn who are these people, what they're talking about. And the whole conference slash workshop in Dallas was called the Emerging Church. That's why I went there. Uh, I attended another one called Emergent Christianity in Alba held in Albuquerque, and this is also where I met uh, Richard Rohr. Now, Richard Rohr said this. This is in a conclusive uh, 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 meeting. He says, we Catholics made a mistake in the 16th century. You Protestants, and a lot of people in the audience are Protestants. He says, you Protestants accused us of being the beast, being the uh, apostate, being heretics, teaching apostasy, teach, and all of that. And we responded to you in the same way, argumentatively. And for 400 years, he said, you guys were publishing books, articles, attacking us, shooting arrows at us, 
and, and we were doing the same thing. And matter of fact, for 400 years, we are fighting wars with each other, and we would not even set our foot in each other's church, even if they were just across the street. And by the middle of 20th century, we decided, now he's speaking as one of these progressives, and he said, we recognize we made a mistake, and we decided we are not going to deal with you Protestants Dominican way, we are going to deal with you Franciscan way. Do you know anything about Dominicans and Franciscans? Both of those Catholic orders go back to the 14th century, 13th century. Now, both of them take vows of charity and poverty and all that. Both of them practice mystical practices, they meditate, contemplate, and all of that. Both of them uh, believe in education. Matter of fact, higher, higher education. However, whereas Franciscans emphasize primarily contemplation and meditation, Dominicans emphasize primarily argumentative uh, dialogue and so on. Learn, get educated, and argue academically and prove the other side wrong. Now, did you get the point what he meant? He said, for 400 years we were arguing. We're not going to argue with you anymore. We're going to pray with you. Did you notice that? That when people get together and study the Bible, even, I mean, even if you, a group of you, five, six of you get together, you start, and you start decide, we are going to study the Bible. And you start reading text by text, and you take commentaries, sooner or later, you will get into an argument over a text here and there. It is by nature. Rigorous study brings us into argumentation. It doesn't have to be violent and hateful, but it does. When people pray, they don't argue. And that was kind of a shift when he made that statement. Present Pope did not choose name Francis by accident. So keep that in mind. Now, ecumenical movement, mysticism, the third component, what you guys are interested in, which is very important for emergent Christianity, it's theistic evolutionism. I have learned through my research our problem, or our major adversary today, for us Seventh-day Adventists, given the raison d'etre why we exist, is not Charles Darwin as much as it is Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Pierre Teilhard de Chardin was a French Jesuit, dedicated Catholic, but also a person who loved science and became well-known paleontologist. He spent some, approximately 20 years in the late 1930s, 1940s in China. He is connected with the discovery of the Beijing men. He, is, he published in science, and he published in theology. His goal life was to bring science and Christianity together. Charles Darwin argued materialistic evolution. He argued that evolutionary process is driven by natural selection. But Charles Darwin was challenged even in his own days by his friends and colleagues and his contemporaries. And they asked him, and they challenged him, if you argue that matter is all there is, ever was, and ever will be, 
Where does life and intelligence come from? Matter doesn't have it. And it cannot give it. So, it took a whole generation for contemporaries and successive philosophers and some scientists who are trying to save evolutionary theory and yet come up with an answer. Where does life come from? And what happens about 40 years later, a whole generation or maybe generation and a half later, British philosopher Conway Lloyd, George, Lloyd Morgan came up with a work. If you want to go to Amazon, type in emergent evolution. Lloyd Morgan came up with a systematic, well-developed argument that there is such a thing, not natural revolution, materialistic, but emergent evolution. Basically, he, doesn't, uh, he did not admit that, but the way he did it, uh, he actually had to borrow from Eastern religions, from monistic uh, systems. Now, he's not interested in Christianity. So you have materialistic evolution, moves now, we have stepped to emergent evolution. Tayyar de Chardin is contemporary of Lloyd Morgan. Tayyar de Chardin disagreed with Charles Darwin. And he said, evolutionary process is driven by principle of emergence. And Charles Dar and Tayyar de Chardin comes up with a very interesting, uh, I'm going to show you the, the this patient for a second here. He comes up with, okay, this is his uh, diagram from his book. As you can see, what he says is, evolutionary process uh, leads the entire creation into divergence. So you have different uh, species and different kinds and all of that. You guys are way more sophisticated in talking about That's the point. However, do you see how there at a certain point, um, uh, I don't know how to use, how do you, oh. Okay, do you see uh, this line here? Do you see now what's happening? Tayyar de Chardin argues that, and just keep this in mind, I'm gonna come back to this. Okay, he argued that all, everything, everything that exists, Matter, intelligence, knowledge, truth, spiritual realm, all goes through evolutionary process, a process driven by principle of emergence, a pushed forward through four coexistent stages. St these stages that I will mention, they are not successive. They are kind of one emerges and then the other one and they st keep following, okay? And they all, at the present right now, all of them are working. 15 billion years ago, cosmogenesis begins. Approximately 2 billion years ago, life breaks through. It's kind of, there is a process goes on, and there is a break. Factor X moves in, and life appears. Now, approximately, what, 1 million years ago, new genesis stage begins, which means life acquires intelligence and it keeps going. And uh, the fourth stage is Christogenesis, which means, and this is, um, okay, when it be, that convergence now begins to take place with the incarnation of cosmic Christ. Now, the incarnation is not exactly the same what you and I think about 2,000 years ago when Jesus was born from his mother Mary. We are not talking about that. He simply comes up, he's not precise whether it is 10, 15, 20,000 years ago, but the incarnation of cosmic Christ, that's important. And it is way more important where the creation goes. That's Tayard's argument. It's not, uh, creation should not be defined so much by how it originated, 
It is how it will end. And from this point on, Christ, the task of Christ is to take the entire creation toward the omega point, where in creation becomes one with omega. Presumably omega is Christ, divine God. So you can see here very much pantheistic, monistic, Brahmanist understanding. Now, this is graphic presentation of how he understood. Now, this is not true to scale because I'm dealing here with billions of years and in order to make it visible for you, what you have here is this shape is supposed to show you this uh, divergence and then you have convergence. So we live today in this, this period of time. Now if, you, now, if you understand, you get this, often you will see, and don't be surprised, that present emphasis in Christianity is Catholics, Protestants, all emergence is emphasis on social activism. There's nothing wrong with being socially active, but the primary emphasis is on social activism. Why? Because the belief is that we live in an age of the spirit, we live in the kingdom of God here and now. Now, for you and me to speak of the second coming, it makes no sense for Tayardian worldview. You bring any Okay. If you bring into the picture any kind of, let me see, I, I want to show you. Just give me a, in order to save time here. Okay, here. I have another picture. Now, at the bottom here, this is Tayardin, except that uh, the divergence is not shown here. We live in the kingdom of God here and now, age of the spirit. Christogenesis Omega. This here above the blue line, this is a, pretty much according to the scale. This is Seventh-day Adventist scheme. Now, you can substitute this Adventist scheme with, let's say, Schofield scheme. Or scheme about the rapture or Pentecostals or Protestants or Preterist view or Futurist view. You, you remember all those arguments we were studying all of that? Different schemes and we are trying to argue this is the correct, the others are false. Tayardian worldview eliminates all of these schemes and this is what is now being accepted. Today, it is pretty much, you go out there and talk, it's pretty much ridiculous to talk about these different schemes. This particular theistic evolutionary system that Tayard has created is so close to and acceptable to many Christians because it eliminates argumentation and points to the world today. And it calls the public to engage in it. Let's do it. We can do it. Science has helped us to come this far. Matter of fact, and I should stop here, give you some time for Q&A here. Matter of fact, there are groups already who are building upon this, and they are arguing that science and evolutionary process has brought us to a point 
where we humans with technology and knowledge and artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, all of that, we are able to reach next stage, which they call transhuman change. We can become more than human. We can extend our life to maybe a thousand years. Now, they are not a large group, but they are there. Just go Google transhumanism. But you're going to get it, a, lot, a lot of it. Do you see where it's going? Now, I'm going to stop here, kind of let you ask questions. I don't know how much you follow the quarterly. And I, by accident, I decided since I was coming here, I said, okay, I don't know, you know how much do they follow quarterly. Let me see what is the quarterly discussing this week. Emergent Christianity, I am convinced more and more, the more deeper I go, emergent Christianity is what we Seventh-day Adventists refer to for a long time, the New Babylon in the Scriptures. If you know the Catholic theology, which argues that the Church is the body of Christ, incarnated Christ. And there are Catholic theologians who are arguing, and it took Catholic leadership to recognize Tayardian contribution. What Tayard argued or suggested is that the church, Christ is leading the entire creation to Omega. Since the church is the incarnated Christ, the church should lead the entire creation to Omega Point. You're talking about the healing of the deadly wound? Everything is beginning to set in place. So let me stop here and start that. you guys ask questions because, yes. Just a minute, let's hand our mic over to him. So just give us a sound bite on the definition of modern and postmodern. So postmoderns reject all meta narratives. Meta narrative is meta above narratives. Meta -narr okay, modern world argue that there are natural laws, there are there is truth that we can discover through, by dis uh, studying nature. And modern world argued that there are narratives, ide let's put it different, ideologies, isms, which are universal, applicable to all cultures, and uh, above all other narratives. Marxism is one of those. Seventh-day Adventists have our meta-narrative is great controversy. We believe that great controversy is a narrative above all narratives. Postmodern world rejects that and argues every tribe, every group has its own narrative and every narrative deserves attention and respect and they are all equal. That's one, and it's major. No this thing. Uh, pretty much, no absolute. Every idea is equal. Uh, pretty much. I'm, I'm fascinated, John, with uh, the kingdom of God as de Chardin's contribution. <clears throat> Interestingly, this is very biblical that we are now, it, you know, with Christ here we are in the kingdom of God. Interestingly, in the process, he ignores Christ's own words about a future perfection and restoration. 
That at least what? that's what it seems to me. In other words, there's no, in that picture, there's no such thing as a second coming. We're here getting better and better all the time. Yeah. Moving toward the Omega point, which is interesting to make it Christocentric and then ignore Christ's own words. Okay. Is that that's your question, comment? Yes. Okay. My response to that is, yes, I agree with you, except one little detail that you just said. Tayardi and the... Tayardian system appears to be biblical. It sounds biblical. It's totally counter to biblical teachings. Because when you go and, for example, if you say that everything goes through evolutionary process, let's take one example, truth. Truth itself goes through evolutionary process. In that kind of understanding, Truth in 2018 is superior and more authoritative than truth at any point in time in the past. Thank you. You're confirming what I meant no, to okay. say. That is, that is what they are the saying. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible, okay, you see the for example. No. The Catholic Church can say, and the emergence can say, truth about Christ, about anything in the Bible. You take a verse of the Bible, you want to explain it. Teaching of the Bible, you want to explain it. What we know today is more authoritative and superior than what people knew 500 years ago or 3,000 years ago. That's counter to no. the Bible. That's not biblical. That's, that's very clear, and that was my point. Okay. They've, uh, Christ somehow is somebody you can't find from Scripture because Scripture is irrelevant. Yeah, okay. That, uh, I, assume, I understood that you said this is biblical. What they are is saying is kind of a, it's a, it's a counter, counterfeit. Well, uh, it's not time now, but I'd like okay. to sometime hear where he gets the idea of Christ in divine if it doesn't, if it isn't founded in scripture. I, I mean, you did, okay, I don't know who decides here, who speaks next. <laughs> um, in this picture here, where does God come in uh, in cosmogenesis and biogenesis? Is he considered active there? Uh, where, where's God in the picture here uh, uh, in, the, in these new ideas or in uh, emergency? <laughs> emergency. Okay, where God comes in according to this understanding? Yeah. Okay, look, look at this slide. All mm. goes through development, which is now development that that term mm. is borrowed from John Henry Newman's book essays on development uh, uh, of doctrine and that's published middle of 19th century that term development was used as a platform later for uh, Tayard and uh, other academics and school uh, new theology school of thought to begin to flirt with the idea of evolutionary theory because development here by John Henry Newman actually means evolution. But, but that. So all goes through evolutionary process, a predictable move, it's kind of predictable. The direction of which a thing must go if its own laws are followed. Now you have, this is, you have breakthroughs, factor X, something happens which is unpredictable. And this is where kind of divine steps in. And this is how life came. And then later you have intelligence. That idea is borrowed from Brahmanism. Except that Brahman, uh, Brahmanism argues that everything that exists, uh, ever existed, Brahman is always there. Because nothing exists without Brahman. And Brahman is not, it's a divine, but it's not a person. It's something like force, essence, something that keeps everything together, gives it meaning, gives it life, and all of that. So, so this whole idea, it has, have, okay. 
they are the Sardan in order to distinguish his worldview, his understanding, he came up with a term instead of pantheism, panentheism. And emergents use panentheism a lot. And then at one point, one of them, I made a comment, and this particular Catholic teacher who was at these seminars, she reacted because I pointed out to the monistic pantheism and she reacted. She says, no, 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 it's not pante pantheistic. It's panentheistic. And I asked her, okay, now explain what panentheism is. And there's a slight difference without me going in details. Uh, it is mostly kind of a playing on words. There is a difference, a nuance, but it amounts to the same thing. I'm sorry, he decides who talks first, okay. Who talks when? I'd be willing to defer to someone who has more an expert relevance to what we're talking about. But in, if I may, I think I represent uh, those in the audience who are mm, by training and by experience medically oriented with very little experience and the knowledge of uh, the intricacies of what you're talking about, but who find it very fascinating and somehow or another it keeps rubbing against us and uh, to one degree or another, and unfortunately, rather minimally, uh, we have encountered some of this. I might just say that the oh, first- Oh, yeah, you are encountering it. <laughs> I might just say that the first time I ever heard the term emergent Christianity was in relation with the senior pastor at the Hollywood Church, and some of you may know who I'm talking about. His name is Ryan Bell. Oh, that's a friend of mine. <laughs> And uh, I, as my understanding is... He used to is be a friend of mine. He, he was, he, a friend of yours? Well, he married a girl who was the daughter of my best friend. Really? Yeah. Well, then maybe you can tell me why they had the divorce. Be because he decided that he wants to live uh, for a period of time as an atheist to see how atheism and the, the, uh, the marriage could not function under those conditions. And it's sort of what I had figured. She's a beautician, I understand. Uh, and um, at any rate, I, I, as I understand, I just sort of assumed that he picked it up in Fuller Seminary where he got a lot of his... Whatever he picked it up, he became, for a period of time, he was one with the group of the emergents, very close friend with Brian McClare mm -hmm. and the others. But he used to tout the emergent but, religion quite a bit. Yeah, he was heavy in social activism, all of that. Yes, but then very. about three years ago, I believe, Esnes, three years ago, he decided that he wants to live as an atheist to see how that is. That's exactly what I was leading to. And it's, it's very interesting that the emerging church led him not to a convergence of the omega, omega point in religion, but exactly the opposite to atheism, which he tried to make a, a living off from, but I'm not sure that really worked out. But, but as I understand there, there, it, where- There is another person called Rob Bell, who is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, who has a big following. And he based with this Tayardian idea, which is he is not, talking about, but he comes to a point that the entire creation will be saved. Huh. But as I understand it, uh, Ryan Bull is coming to the point in his atheism where he is somehow amalgamating his atheism with spirituality. Well, that doesn't surprise me. You know why? If you, if you read about so-called new atheists today, Atheism as a, as an ism, as a system, as a worldview, could not sustain itself, cannot survive in human race. Atheism argues that matter is all there is, ever was, and ever will be. It leads people, especially individuals who are in their crisis, it leads people, logically, leads people to nihilism or nihilism. And nihilists often commit suicide. 
in history, context of history, existentialism was an attempt to save atheism and materialism from nihilism. The argument that John Paul Sartre and others made in the 1950s and 60s, life is absurd, which correct it is. Ecclesiastic talks about the absurdity of life, except that the scripture tells us life is absurd, but there is the creator, remember him. Jean-Paul Sartre and others argued, well, life is absurd, make a meaning out of your life, how? Well, find something meaningful and do it. So existentialism, and we are, our society is very much existentialist today, and postmodern and many other things. So I am not surprised that even atheists today, new atheists, these so-called new atheists, even they begin to admit that there is something spiritual. <laughs> Which of course. And one thing that I think is a good lesson with him is that. Give her the mic. I, I didn't mean to take your time. I just wanted to point out that one thing that is, I think, important in his case, and I think a good lesson for all of us is that uh, because we knew him personally, is that his descent into atheism was, was really gradual as he began to slowly accept uh, and incorporate a lot of these ideas that are out in the world and social issues that we're all facing like LGBTQ and others and creationism, as he slowly began to accept and incorporate those in his own life. Uh, I think it's a good lesson for all of us. Step that by it was step. Little by little. It wasn't all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. Step by step, unfortunately. Our friend Brian, no, Ryan, gave up on all Adventist teachings, one by one. How do you live like an atheist? I don't know. You have to ask him. <laughs> <laughs> um, Seventh-day Adventists at the crossroads, what should we be looking for? What would be signs and symptoms? Where, where are we? I am often asked that question, <laughs> and my answer to you, ma'am, is, I'm often asked by mothers, oh, I'm afraid to send my children to school. Mm -hmm. I said, ma'am, I grew up in a communist Yugoslavia. My teachers were all atheists. I was kind of given a hard time, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I can tell you one thing. And I'm, my answer to your question is, get to know the scriptures inside yes. out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you will survive. I take a model, I'm giving you an analogy. The Bible talks to us that there is Jesus Christ and the church is the bride. You can now translate that on a personal level. Jesus is my groom and I am the bride. Mm -hmm. Now, in every relationship between the bride and the groom, don't forget, in this world, <coughs> there is a seducer, mm -hmm. the third party. And the seducer wants to seduce the girl. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know anything about womanizers and seducers or seduct, even seductresses, let's put it for both uh, genders, okay? They can talk the language of the groom. Mm -hmm. And they promise and they give compliments and they do all kinds of things. The difference is that the groom loves the bride the, and wants to marry her. The seducer wants to have her for one night. Mm -hmm. When I share that with my students, my sh usually the girls, this, oh, oh, how do I know? <laughs> I says, if you know your groom, you will That's always good. recognize the seducer's lies. That's good. And my answer is, know that Bible inside out, Amen. and you will survive. That's all I can tell you. I don't know. Of course, I give you these presentations. Now you can see similarities. And my point is not, I'm telling people, my point is not now, oh, Markovic said this and this. And every time you hear somebody says something, oh, point a finger at the person. We all read all kind of literature and ideas are getting into our heads. And I hear pastors 
left and right, our pastors, who are, and I can identify, oh, he read that book, oh, he read that author, because they come up with the ideas and statements which are counter biblical. Okay. So we, I try to teach my students, get to know that Bible, my goodness. And unfortunately, I have to tell you that I don't know what's happening in the present generation. Most, I can say 60-70% of my students, they hardly ever open the Bible. I mention certain terms, they have no idea what I'm talking about. So that's our state of being right now. The only place I have heard this talked about <laughs> is in the Mentone Church. And I know it's probably considered um, works-oriented and so forth, but they do have a lot of books in the area you're talking about and um, mm -hmm. are available to anybody who wants to ask them for those books. Do you have a source uh, that you would recommend uh, which, from your perspective of books on the emergent church and which, which the Omega? Which church did you mention? Mentone, California. Mentone? Oh. Tom Anderson. Tom Anderson? Oh, John Anderson. Okay, let's not keep in mind that one. I want to check that. Do you have a source that... My answer to you is, okay, I am currently, for a number of years, I'm writing on emerging church, history, theology, and as a worldview. I cannot, I can give you certain books to read if you want to go into the study. But I have no one, no one to recommend what I'm talking about, nobody's going in that direction so yes. far. So I cannot tell you read this one, that one. I don't want you to go in a direction that I believe is not. Yes. If you're referring to the book by Howard, is that the book you're referring to? Well, there are a lot of little books. I can't give you the, the, Omega, the, the Omega Deception. and. The only comment I can take, take, tell you about Rick Howard, I read his book and I met the person. He is talking from experience because he was involved in Hinduism, he was involved with a Catholic uh, certain group up there in New England, and he is making conclusions from his personal experience and quoting Ellen White. I am doing it research, academic research, and conclusions are the same. How soon will we but have your book? It's a different approach. How soon will we have your book? <laughs> <laughs> Six months, a year? <laughs> <laughs> ma'am, uh, ma'am, I am a full-time teacher and I have to teach. But um, if you are interested, if you are interested, you can go to YouTube, you can go to Google, you can go to Audioverse, that's Adventist. And uh, many of these churches where I go and, uh, and give my presentations, they tape it and they put it online. Okay, just one quick question. Okay, one just one quick question. You've been saying a word that it sounded to me like uh, the proper pronunciation of the word Brahman, B-R-A-H-M. Brahman, Brahman. Is, is, is that the Indian word that you were using? Yeah, Brahman is not only Indian, but Brah Buddhists and Hindus and variety of Buddhism, they use Brahman. Brahman is the most superior deity. Actually, it is a deity that mm -hmm. encompasses all other deities. Okay. And so, um, it's not a person, you have to keep that in mind. Jehovah, Yahweh, is a person. She can ask her cousin who has dozens of books on this topic. Okay. I'll talk to her later. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you a question, though. As I was doing my research on the religious right and its influence in public education, I ran a across a lot on uh, spiritism. Are you making any connections in your research to spiritism? If you, if you begin to get involved in spiritual disciplines which are created to lead you to spiritual formation, that's another term that Adventists are struggling over. Um, spiritual formation is 
a counterfeit to what we Adventists refer to for years and decades, sanctification. If you get involved into mysticism, it will lead you to spiritism. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in workshops that I attended. I did not participate. I was there and I've seen how they train people to do spiritual mm -hmm. discipline, spiritual formation. They were explaining all mm -hmm. of that. And I, and, I, and I saw what is happening. And uh, my conclusion is, this is not the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It was basically pagan worship. It seems to me that we're seeing increasing um, voices in Adventism that are either social justice warriors or various kinds of feminism or going to the Moonies and having um, meetings with them and having Jesus as the focus who is a very strange Jesus. Uh, it seems to me, and I agree with you, that we need to be in the Word. But we're changing our focus in education to get away from the word and going towards mystical practices that are mm -hmm. not Adventist. Spiritual mm -hmm. disciplines, and anything, by the way, anything can become a spiritual discipline. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful, even Sabbath keeping can become spiritual discipline. This forces us mm -hmm. Adventists to pay attention to salvation by grace of God, not by what we do. I observe the Sabbath not to be saved. I observe the Sabbath because I want to honor and identify with God. Okay, and you can go on and on with everything else. And so uh, mysticism is a shortcut. It is much easier to contemplate and meditate because they believe that by contemplation and meditation in certain manner we are preparing ourselves to hear the divine voice whether it comes from inside of us or whether it comes from outside mm -hmm. and simple biblical truth is if you want to hear the voice of God it is in the Bible but the now, teaching today is the voice of God is within you. Just listen well, to yourself. Now, yeah. if God wants to talk to you, God will do it at his own choosing and in mm -hmm. his own way. <clears throat> For you and me to designate a sacred place, to do certain rituals, to make God talk to me is not biblical. And it is pagan. You are actually... Mysticism leads you into idolatry. Yes. Yeah. I'm just thinking that this whole trend here. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a scientist usually, and I'm so glad to get to science where I got some facts and some uh, statistics and other factors that I can put together to make some sense out of what I see. Uh, and uh, when I start reading all this theology stuff, I, I'm also glad I'm a scientist. Uh, because, you know, talk about X factors and other things. Are these folks not concerned that they're just uh, uh, in an essentially nihilistic uh, uh, mode, uh, don't they realize if you bang your head against the wall, it's going to hurt? Uh. <laughs> to answer to your question is, you come across as a person who is thinking analytically and critically. You believe in rigorous study, mm -hmm. where analysis and critical thinking is important. This is why you are thankful that you're a scientist. There are a lot of people who don't take analytical, critical approach to knowledge. For many years I wondered how in the world are we going to, how in the world will this world one day 
except this being who appears and claims that he is Jesus Christ. Because we who are scientifically oriented beings, analytical and critical, we look at him and say, get away from us. Well, as you probably noticed in answer to your question also, in contemporary postmodern world, analytical critic, if you notice, those of you who are educators, have you noticed that critical analytical approach and rigorous study in academia is being downplayed? Mm -hmm. yeah. Today, even people in their everyday language, when they talk, instead of saying, I believe, they say, I feel. So my students often improperly respond and say, I feel. I say, what do you feel? I want to know what do you know, what do you believe on a certain issue. Mm -hmm. So what I'm trying to say is mystical approach where feelings are emphasized is more and more overtaking even scientists. And Richard Rohr in one of his presentations in Dallas, Texas, he pointed out the following. <coughs> he said, science and spirituality that we are teaching you is getting closer and closer. And he made the following statement. He said, right now, and this was back in 2010, he said, right now, there is approximately 20% of scientists who are accepting that spiritual phenomena needs to be addressed scientifically. And Richard Rohr argued, he uh, made a statement, he said, this number of percentage of scientists who are seriously taking mystical practices to be studied is increasing and it will increase to the point that people will scientifically demonstrate that mystical the, uh, events or experiences will be scientifically proven. Now, let me point out to you something. If I am trained slowly into spiritual disciplines as a mystic, and to become a mystic, it takes time. You have to be trained to become a mystic. And Richard Rohr says, those of you who are sitting in this audience who are by nature an analytical, <coughs> critical thinkers, he says, you will have a very hard time to contemplate and meditate and achieve this contemplative consciousness. That means a level of state of mind in which you are able to hear the divine voice. And he suggests that we have to change our way of thinking. And he has a whole lecture on that. So you will be very difficult to become mystic. And I'm <laughs> sitting there and I'm saying, he's talking about me. I am very analytical and critical. I don't place much on feelings. Feelings can change all the time. So to answer your question is, more and more scientists will begin to play with it. And once they begin to play, they're gonna go deeper and deeper and deeper. So, when this person, I'm talking about Lucifer, Satan, when he appears as a false Christ, science will help them. Science, there is a proper science, properly done science, and there is a whatever. And you probably recognize that in your own field. Evolution, of course, is an example. Yeah. You were talking about um, hearing the voice of God in the contemplative mystical experience. Um, a safe way to do that, I think, I believe, I don't just feel, um, 
is to take a Bible verse. Yeah. And as an editor, it's easy to do this from my own background. Um, change it from you to I, or he to I, or whatever it needs to be, like John 3.16, for God so loved the world. If I wanted to imagine God speaking to me in that verse, I would just edit it to say, I, God, so love you, Bonnie, that I gave my only begotten son, Jesus, and if you believe in him, you will not perish, you will live forever. Now that to me, it does more than just an editorial transmission. It helps me think of God and me having a personal relationship that he's talking not just generically to the whole world. The world needs to hear that verse, but it helps me take it personally without putting words in God's mouth. Okay, I appreciate your comment and I would say, yes, you bring it down to personal level, individualize it, and that's good. I will just make one comment to it. Be careful. Yes. There are a lot of, there is also a teaching by the emergence. Be careful not to use Bible verses as mantra. A lot of people, mantra. In contemplation and meditation, you know, okay, here you need a little explanation. Okay, in contemplation and meditation, in order to reach this level of consciousness where your mind is able to hear, hear the words. In other words, you have to stop the analytical processes of your mind. You have to stop it. That's like a self-hypnosis. But the point is that in order to do that, you have to slow it down. And in order to do that, you have to use mantra. If you start repeating, and there, in Christian mysticism, they recommend use biblical verses as a mantra. And I'm saying be careful not to do that. Because, because, this is the key. God himself wants your mind to work in full capacity when he talks to you. I had to listen for over an hour to an... Well, mind has, uh, okay, mind... Uh, I'm, talk I'm talking about reasoning. I mean, God says, come, let us reason together. God wants our faculties. Okay, Ellen White speaks about five faculties of the mind, and that is con conscience, through which he speaks to us, reason, these two are the higher okay. faculties, and you have lower, and the lower is memory, will, and... Uh, and what is and, and affection? Animals have the lower three. We have it. The higher two are human. So make be careful that you don't dull your conscience, and be be careful that your analytical critical thinking is shut. That's why we are vegetarians. That's why we talk about healthy body, healthy mind. God wants my mind to be at the best to work not to slow it down, mm -hmm. which is totally opposite. Unless you're anxious and ready and, yes. and, and trusting and Amazing. so forth. If you want to be, if you want, if you are, if you are anxious, disappointed, de depressed and all of that, my advice to you is pick up the Bible. I, when I was in those situations, I always went to the Gospel of John. Yeah. Don't use mantras. What, honestly, my friends, what I have seen, it's like a person, have you read the book by Ali Wiesel of the, that tiny little book, Night, where he gives his experience? An old man in the village, Hungarian village where Ali Wiesel lived, Beadle, he was caught by Germans, took to the Auschwitz. Somehow, this little old man, crazy man, succeeded of getting out comes back to the village and tells the Jews what's happening. Nobody believes him. Sometimes I feel like Beetle. Mm. I tell him, listen guys, I was there. I saw what these guys are doing, what they are teaching and preparing others to teach. Don't, my advice is don't, when people start talking about spiritual disciplines, going contemplation, meditation. I say, forget about it. By the way, contemplation, meditation by mystics is different than contemplation, meditation, 
mentioned in the Psalms, Amen. in the Bible. That's right. The wife talks about yeah, that's just the count. Meditating biblically is different. That's meditating with the full faculty of reasoning. Mm. Mysticism is teaching you to dull down your faculty of reasoning. That's our music, point. our music today in our Adventist churches are repeating, repeating, repeating. And I've, I have been concerned about this for a long, I'm an educator. There is, there is a- Our small children are doing this in our schools. Ma'am, there, there is a spiritual discipline called Teze Songs, invented around the turn of the century, back in you know, the early 20th century in France. And it is, have you noticed these songs where you have only one liner, it's keep repeating. Yes. Those are songs created for spiritual disciplines. Mm. Wow. They're like mantras. They are mantras. They are. They are. We had a couple of years ago, my wife and I were standing, and they had you know, a PMC there, you know, sometimes they, they have good songs, and then there was a song, one liner. And for some reason, I don't know why, the band kept playing and they are repeating. And it went into the sixth and seventh minute. By then, the, and they asked us to stand and we were standing. And I just kind of told my wife, okay, look at now what's gonna happen. By the sixth minute, you can see that people are beginning to lose it. Yes. Why? There is something about music. Now keep in mind, music is activity, which is to shape our moods. The question is always, what kind of mood do you want to create in worship? Whether it's collective or private. You can take a music and play it, sing it, to a group of young men who are going into battle knowing that they will die and they do it. Mood. And so when people come up with music and say, well, I can't tell you, you know, what is right and what is wrong, wrong music. All I can tell you is, what kind of mood do you want? Yes. You can have sensual music. Do you want sensual worship? Which I have also seen once in Adventist worship. That's nothing but, uh, but pagan. That's right. Or do you want this, like we mentioned, Teze song? Now, those people who do that, they often are ignorant. They just think, oh, this is cute. <laughs> but it has effect on people. It changes the mood. That's right. Do you want that? My, my said, no, forget it. Out. So yes, you have all kinds of that happening. It's this stuff that I'm discovering here. It's everywhere. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if you place the, um, manif the what do you call these, the ascended masters and the speaking from Jesus in person to members of our church in their private life. Uh, does that fit into this emergent church or is that a new age thing and is new age and emergent the same? I, I was last night just met with some folks and they were saying, well, we'll have to talk to the master. They're talking about an ma ascended master. And I'm not familiar with this ascended master. All that well, and, and these people are, one of them believes that they are about to ascend themselves to become a master, which okay. I would have thought meant death. But, um, you know, they're, they're very serious and they're people who've been all their lives in the Adventist church. Not a, not a major manifestation, but I'm wondering, is, is that, a, you know, is these ascended masters, are they also within this emergent church okay. and this... let me ask you a question. Are they linked in a way, since you know about them, to the New Agers? They are not aware of being at all linked with New Age. Okay, you mentioned New Agers, that's why I ask. Yeah, now, well, you, I, uh, to, I see a similarity, <laughs> but I'm just wondering... There are similarities, but New Agers, New Age movement, that is the phenomenon of 1960s and 70s. That's basically bringing Eastern religions into this Western world. Emergent Christianity is a much more complex. 
it's ecumenical, it is mystical, it is theistic evolutionist, there are some other characteristics. So emergent Christianity kind of, it's way bigger and more complex than New Ageism. Is it more devious? Yes. Subtle? I can tell you this, in my estimate, uh, contem uh, this emergent Christianity is the best. Now, when I say the best, I don't mean I agree with it. It is the best counterfeit to biblical teachings. Only the devil can be behind it. It is, I read emergent literature, and I go page after paragraph after paragraph, page after page, and I, I find myself, and I say, wait a minute, I am, this sounds like Alan G. White writing. And then suddenly they, they make the, the author makes a conclusion and I say, how in the world did he conclude this? So I have to go back to find where is that logical leap. It's a very, it's a, okay. You, you heard me talking today about, and I was not like a lot of critics, like some Adventists, they are actually taking a club and beating emergent movement. I don't do that. Sometimes some people accuse me of propagating emergent Christianity because they don't listen carefully. I am totally opposed to it. I think it's a counterfeit. But as you see how I'm presenting, it is easy to take it because I'm trying to be fair. So, okay, this and this. And you have people who say, well, it kind of makes sense. It appears to make sense. But it's not. It's a counterfeit. It's, it's kind of Just a minute. Am I taking you place, know, <coughs> am I taking place of the sermon, my goodness? In order yeah. Um, you know how there are optical illusions? Yeah. Well, there are also philosophical illusions and there are also <laughs> spiritual illusions. Yeah. And I I would suggest that perhaps this is a combination of the latter too philosophical yeah. and spiritual. You can say, if I can use the Hindu term, this is Maya. It's illusion. That's what Maya. Maya is, uh, uh, if uh, Buddh uh, Hinduism teaches, if you come to believe that, let's say, this bottle has nothing to do with Brahman, then Hindu will tell you, well, that, that means that, my, uh, that bottle is Maya. It's illusion. It's not true because Brahman is in everything. So, kind of emergent Christianity is the best counterfeit. And that is what I'm concluding when you think about it, how far, I can't, you know, you, we don't have time, but you can mention any biblical teaching that we believe, and I can through slow analysis demonstrate to you that Tayardian worldview undermines it. Every single biblical teaching from doctrine of sin, doctrine of the Sabbath, second coming, righteous, salvation by the grace of God, I mean anything. This doctrine, un this worldview undermines everything, yet it appears so close to ideal good Christianity. It is so attractive. Do you know that emergence, they don't believe, for example, most of them are vegetarian because they take care of the body. That's, you know, like we do. Do you know that emergence totally reject the doctrine of hell? So you say, wow, they're like we Advent. Well, yes, but they still believe in the eternal soul and all of that stuff. So you have a lot of things that are, they are so, I mean, ecumenical unity. I mean, that's attractive. Why do we argue? We should work together. Well, but ecumenical unity has one big problem because the best example, I don't have to argue, this is what happened in Andrews University in 2012. We had a guest speaker, 
um, um, Michael Kinnaman. Michael Kinnaman used to be the General Secretary of National Council of Churches. The man is ecumenicalist in heart. But he's a friend of our faculty at Andrews University. He came to Andrews University to talk. He was praising Adventists and he was talking to, uh, to us Adventists there. I had a privilege to have a lunch with a group of dozen of us who, with him. And the man is saying, why don't you come and join us at, at, at the ecumenical table and help us to know how to honor Sabbath? Those are his words. He said, we love you Advent Adventists. I love how you observe the Sabbath. I love how you honor it. Your love for the Sabbath. I wish we have the same thing. So. He spoke in the seminary chapel on Thursday evening. And at one point in his speech, and the chapel is packed with faculty and students. And so he makes a point and he says, would you be interested? He said, I have a question. Would you be interested to join us at the ecumenical table and teach us how to honor the Sabbath and how to love the Sabbath? The entire audience said, Yes. And he was encouraged. And then he said, well, I have one more question. Would you make that coming, teaching us how to love and honor the Sabbath? Would you make that your primary objective? And make it secondary objective, which day is the Sabbath? <laughs> to which the audience responded, no. And he was surprised by it. And I, I sat in the third row, I already knew where he's going, because I already talked with him, and I could see on his face, it just changed. And he looked down, and uh, in a resigned voice, and I'm trying to imitate that, he said, well, if that's the case, then you do not belong at the ecumenical table. There is an unwritten rule. If you want to join, and it is noble to join, why not? Let's work together. But there is an unwritten rule. If you join, let us do and talk about what unites us. And let's not talk about things that divide us. Can we Seventh-day Adventists stop talking about which day is the Sabbath, about the second coming of Jesus, and many other doctrines if we are there, they themselves tell us, I'm sorry, you don't belong there. Do you see how it is attractive? You got it? Yes. I, I have a question. Um, as I understood it, uh, Taylor de Chardin, uh, Chardin, my Pierre French Pierre is Chardin. horrible. No. Anyway, I, I, just, I read just it more than I see it. Uh, um, as I understand it, uh, there was a time when the Catholic Church frowned upon his uh, his way of looking at things. Yes, in 1946, when he came from China, he submitted his uh, his uh, manuscript, The Phenomenon of Man to the Holy Office in Vatican to receive him premature. They read it, they didn't know what to do with it. Because it contradicted, because many of them were still creationists. And also, the entire, the, the entire uh, team and the book, it was destroying the doctrine of the original sin. And they prohibited him to publish the book and prohibited him to teach at Catholic universities. He, as a good Catholic, he submitted to it and accepted the verdict. Moved to the United States and died in 1955. However, while he was alive, he was sharing his manuscripts with his colleagues. Three months after his death, his friends published the book. And the book, The Phenomenon of Man, he wrote a few other books. The book, Phenomenon of Man, back in around probably 
around 2000, 1990s, uh, Collins publisher, what is it, uh, Collins, Harper Collins yeah. uh, publisher, they carried a survey about what is the most spiritual book by the public. The Phenomenon of Man was number one. Phenomenon of Man is a very popular book. It's very difficult to read. You buy it, read it, you'll probably leave it after five, five. but so, anyway. So yeah. what, you're, what you're describing then appears to be a sea change in the way the Catholic Church approaches That's right. uh, uh, other churches, the way it approaches theology, oh, the, the way it approaches... The Protestants gave up already. They are just following. Anglicans, Lutherans, Presbyterians. Today, if you go out there, it doesn't make any more sense Hey, I am a pres to say I'm a Presbyterian, I am a Episcopalian, I am an Anglican, Lutheran, doesn't matter, because they are all kind of talking the same thing and moving the same direction. Uh, yes, it is a sea change. Uh, I can give you another example. Uh, John Paul II, the late Pope, in back in 1970s, he made a statement that uh, uh, ev evolutionary theory is uh, uh, one of the alternatives, acceptable alternatives, to explain Genesis 1. Uh, then uh, Benedict XVI, Ratzinger, who is kind of a little more conservative, uh, Ratzinger in also made a statement that uh, um, evolutionary theory is, is probably uh, uh, the way to explain Genesis 1. Francis just recently made a statement is that Genesis 1 is to be interpreted only through. So it's slowly accepting, uh, and pretty much today the leadership is there. Francis, Pope Francis, in my estimate, is the best embodiment of the spirit of Tayardianism. Matter of fact, right now, I just read it a couple months ago, last November, I just read it somewhere that uh, the Jesuit order asked the Pope to resign the, that prohibition of publishing Tayardian work, which was put back uh, <coughs> in uh, 1946 to take it back. So we are waiting now to see what will Francis do. <coughs> but despite the fact that he's dead, it is his friends and the followers who carry the day. The idea is there. The worldview is there. Is that enough? Well, thank you very much for well, thank uh, you for inviting me. Presentation. And I hope this was enlightening and helping you. And uh, my dear sister, there, uh, first volume. And I'm talking about writing on a worldview, Christ uh, emerging Christianity as a worldview. That is going to probably, I'm planning, I have to finish the manuscript this summer. So you know how it, it takes months, the publishers, to publish it. The second volume will be on the history of the emerging church. And the third volume will be on the theology. Everybody wants to talk about theology, which is the most controversial. I have not yet decided, but I'm, I'm aiming at a non-Adventist publisher. I will approach Interversity or Oxford Press. Whether I'm positive or not, I don't know.